Uh, we are sorry. already live on YouTube. So for everybody who has already logged on, we are really, really sorry for the delay. Thank you for being on time, but I promise you, you will not be disappointed. We've got a really, really good webinar um, coming up for you. So um, let's just get started. Just a few admin things that I need to remind everybody. Um, please do keep your mics muted. And if you've got any questions, please type them to the user named Q&A. And if you've got any tech issues, please message the user named tech support. So let's officially begin. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the Science Behind Animal Behavior webinar series, where we will be focusing on feline ethology. We are really pleased to have with us today, Professor Danielle Gunmore as today's speaker for the webinar. Professor Danielle graduated with distinction from the Royal Dick School of Veterinary Studies, University of Edinburgh in 1991. She then went on to complete a residency at the University of Bristol, where she obtained a PhD in feline infectious peritonitis in 1997. After a short stint as a lecturer, she returned to Edinburgh to establish the feline clinic, becoming professor of feline medicine in 2006. Prof. Danielle is an internationally recognized expert in the field of feline medicine. She has lectured extensively. Her work has been published very widely and she has received many prestigious awards for her work over the years. We are really excited to have her with us today. And I'm sure all of you in this session on Zoom as well as on YouTube are really keen to ask questions. Uh, those on Zoom, you can do so by typing your questions into the chat box to the user named Q&A uh, at any time during the session. And a gentle reminder again to please keep your mics muted. Over to you, Prof. Thank you. Let me share my screen. Stop others sharing. Okay. Okay. Tell me when you can see my screen. Hola, happy. Just going to move that. Uh, I think I just did something stupid. Hang on a second. I am definitely capable of doing something stupid. Let's try that again. Right now, I can't see you, of course. Yeah, good. Um, the slides are okay, and I can see you speaking. That's perfect. Thank you very much. Okay, so I'm uh, my task uh, now is to tell you about the domestication of the cat. Uh, my apologies again for being so late in starting. I know you'll have all been there on time. Occasionally, the, the computers just don't let us do what we want to do. It's so frustrating because the organization has been excellent. That, that was all, all my fault, I'm sure. It's a computer problem, it is usually my fault. Okay, um, this is what, oh, let me give you a better pointer. Ah, let me give you a better pointer, okay? Uh, hopefully you can see my pointer. Um, you can just tell me whether you can. Yes, we can. Thank you. So um, this is our little wild cat, uh, Scottish wild cat, very mysterious, uh, not very many left. They're very, very special to us. We call them our Highland Tigers. I know it's a, a bit hopeful, but yeah, he's, he's our little tiger. Um, so thank you ever so much for all this wonderful organization. Um, and so I'm going to tell you about domestication of the cat. I've got my computer play now. Okay, let's see if that works. That allows me a better point option. I'm just going to move that out there. So. Okay, right. Sorry, my screen was just trying to be silly. Nope, somebody wants in. There we go. Right, now you have all my attention. Welcome, oh, computer. Do not be like this. It's not it is my computer. Oh, come on, just let me move forward. There we go, we'll do it now. I thought it'd be useful to start by just thinking, you know, how popular the domestic cat is. Because it's a very special animal. Now, obviously I'm completely biased. I am professor of feline medicine. All I do is cats. But I pulled together this data for you, which I thought you'd be interested in. 
So we've got the top 10 cat owning countries. And yep, uh, we've got some really good ones in there. Obviously, I'm biased by my little country, which say so we've got something like 10 million um, uh, pet cats, which is pretty good. So this just from the top 10 cat owning countries gives you over a quarter of a million million a lot of cats and of course that doesn't tell you about feral cats which there'll be a lot of those in different countries as well so it certainly is very very um successful um wild animal that has become domesticated because feral cats are still the domestic form of the species i thought it'd be useful to look at this map and we know that the, the fertile crescent, not very crescent shaped, it's a bit more M shaped. Um, this is where the domestic cat, as we know it, was first um, found. Although if you look back at the genetics, it's fascinating. This paper came out um, uh, 2019. Um, Sorry to interrupt, Prof. Um, I oh, think the slide has not moved. Um, would you try so moving on to, yeah, it's still on the cover slide. Okay. In which case, now that's interesting because it's, thank you for, I'm just going to stop sharing on this and see if I can make it. Right. Now, let's see if you'll play. Okay. Hopefully, you yep. then can I see, see the slides. first page can again. Try scrolling to the next slide. Okay, hopefully, can, yep. has it moved on? Yep. Wonderful. So now you can you. see the numbers. Yep. Okay. Um, which is good. And then the map, which I was just talking about. So this map, um, this is the fertile crescent where uh, this is where cats started their route to be domesticated. Um, sort of, we certainly have got really good evidence, bone evidence from uh, 10,000 years ago. But if you actually look at the genetics, so you look back at the genetic footprint, and this paper came out, this is a 2019 paper. Um, this shows that actually the genetic line that became domestic cats separated off from the main line 130,000 years ago. Not 10,000, 130,000 years ago. So actually, Cats have been walking beside man for an awfully long time. But really the, the main walk, shall we say, started here. And it started for very obvious reasons. And that is that um, what, did, what started happening in the Fertile Crescent? Well, of course, it was that humans were growing grains. And we needed to put them in large buildings and where you've got a lot of grain. You've got a lot of mice. Oh, my husband's just trying to hardwire me to make sure we've got stable internet. Okay, perfect. Thank you, Helen. Uh, if the sound is not good enough quality, just tell me and I'll put the headset on. Um, so we've got all of these grain stores, which attracted lots of mice, and lots of mice attract cats. The problem is that cats are solitary hunters and they don't like to be around a lot of other cats. So the first genetic change had to be that the cats had to be able to go, OK, I know I don't like other cats, but I really want those mice. And so the cats that were better able to tolerate um, being next to other cats they got the prize of the mice. So that was the start of it. And then, of course, people saw these beautiful creatures eating the mice and thinking, wow, they're wonderful. I'd like one of those in my house to keep the mice down at my house. And so 
they then had to take the next step, which was to get used to being next to people. And when we look at the genetic difference between wild cats and uh, domestic cats, they are in the genes related to um, appeasement of being able to cope with uh, the stress of being around things that they found scary, which I think is just fascinating. And if you look at this map, um, you've got all the different types of cats. Oh, these are all small wild cats, but it's Felis sylvestris libica is in this area, the fertile crescent area. And really that is where, that is the cat that our domestic cats came from. So here you can see that's the lower of the two pictures. This is um, the, uh, the, the wild cat. Uh, we always think of it as the African wild cat, but I'm going to show you something that's a little bit different from that. But they've got long legs. Um, they are much more friendly than our European wild cat who's in the picture above. It tends to be very secretive, tends to be a big, thick coated cat. Um, and obviously, that coat is not going to be good when you're living in the desert. And the good thing is, is Felis sylvestris lubica, much easier to tame. Are these definitely different species? Well, some people would say no, because they can breed with each other, as they, the domestic cat can breed with them as well. But it is generally accepted that they are different species. If you want to be really strict about it, maybe they are subspecies. Um, uh, these are, uh, are more. Uh, these are um, no, uh, Norwegian uh, wildcats, these ones at the top picture here. So in fact, the genetics, that was a wonderful paper, really fascinating study. And it showed that it wasn't actually the African wildcat, which is where everybody thought the uh, domesticated cats came from, that they actually came from the Middle East, the Middle Eastern wildcats. Although we do know that the different wildcats can interbreed and probably did at different times, and maybe even interbred with some other related uh, smaller cats like the jungle cat, who's shown at the bottom of this picture. So when we look at the origins of the domestic cat, then you've got the, the very gradual and dynamic process of animal keeping which was definitely greater than 10,000 years and something. Um, but there's a path, a separate genetic path from over 130,000 years ago. And then we've got animal breeding, which is a much more um, dynamic, um, uh, a, a much more uh, significant, much more effective way of domesticating the cat. That's really only been the last 200 years. But I wanted to talk about more about animal keeping. So we've got at least 10,000 um, 10, years ago. And I talked about the fact it's very much related to hunting rodents, very, very much. Then there are bone records, certainly from Cyprus. And then, of course, Egypt is what we all talked about in school. Hope you were taught it too. This is from kind of two to, to seven and a half thousand years ago. And we certainly know all the mummies come from, the cat mummies come from about 4,000 years ago. We know that um, you find many, many uh, mummies. This is obviously a mummified cat head at the top. And these are two mummies uh, at the bottom here. What's interesting is when you look at Egyptian art, the cat is always drawn underneath the woman's chair. They were very much seen as uh, emblems of uh, fecundity. Um, so they tended to be under the female chair. I love this picture because this is obviously a, a domestic cat. This is um, a Devon Rex, beautiful breed of cat. And she's looking at this statuette of uh, an Egyptian god. And you can see her thinking, yep, that's me. So from Egypt on, people wanted some of these kittens, and so they tracked them. Um, they particularly selected for pretty ones, like this little Rex, colorful markings, um, and obviously the less reactive, the less aggressive of the, the cats, the kittens that they could find. Um, and I'm sure you all know the stories of if a cat died, then you had to 
shave off an eyebrow to show the world you were grieving. And when you wanted uh, you wanted good to happen, then you would put a, a go to one of the temples, one of the cat temples, and you would pay to have one of their temple cats killed and mummified as a gift to the gods. I know, I'm not sure that is so good for the cats. And the cats were specially bred to be temple cats. Um, it's a fascinating story. And the Egyptians wanted to keep their cats. They were so important. That their, their grain stalks were so precious. So it was illegal to, to take a cat. They weren't gifted to you. They were gods. They were for the Egyptians. But of course, some cats, because cats will be cats, escaped. Some were stolen. And very quickly, um, certainly by the 10th century AD, they had got all over the world. Uh, they just hop on board a ship. Ship always had ships always had mice and rats, so they had plenty of food. And of course, the sailors liked to keep them because they were entertaining. And the ship's captain loved to have the cats there because he didn't get paid if the grain didn't arrive where they were sailing to because all the rats ate it. This is a, a cat, he's quite a famous cat in Tobomori, which is a uh, little island off the uh, northwest of Scotland. And um, it's an island called Mull. And he is the Tobomori cat, he's a ginger cat, and he just sleeps on. This is the main street. It's a tiny, tiny little type place. Everybody knows him and everybody photographs him. He's a great cat. And slowly, mutations started occurring. These are natural mutations, just they occurred by nature. And so obviously all cats started out looking like those desert cats. So they had that agouti pattern, that ticked coat. Black cats, uh, evidence of those were seen from about two and a half thousand years ago, uh, first cats occurring in the Mediterranean. Whereas red cats, you can see two red cats coming here. This, this little guy is a more natural color. This one, you can see they're in different shades. Um, these also were found in the Mediterranean and Asia Minor. And you've got a little gray cat here. In fact, if you look at the tabby markings with him, not so easy to see. He looks like a mackerel of a fish. He's a macro tabby, um, and there are four different types of tabby. Here you can see the blotch tabby, otherwise known as the butterfly tabby or the classic tabby. Um, and that's actually a later mutation that actually occurred in England, whereas this is a, a more standard tabby pattern. And then the Siamese coat pattern that comes from China and Thailand. And their coat pattern is fascinating because it is acromelanotic. Acro means edges, melanotic color. So they only have color on the edges, their ears, their face, the paws, the tail. They have color where the fur, um, where the fur hair follicles are cold. So the edges are cold. If you were to take these two beautiful, very pale coated Siamese, and bring them to Scotland, where I am, where it's very cold, they will actually go darker. Whole bodies will go a little bit darker. Um, and yeah, so their colouring is all temperature dependent. It's quite fascinating. Then there is a little bit of difference between depending which countries had which religions. And generally, um, Certainly in the Middle Ages, in Christianity, so that was particularly Northern Europe, we had this crazy idea that cats, for some reason, were something to do with Satan. I know, particularly black cats, and we killed so many. So there's still not that many black cats here. Absolutely crazy. Whereas generally, Islamic countries really liked cats, and they still tend to have more cats. So there is variation day to day, um, and there's less there's less uh, religious effect, um, but it has had an effect over the ages. So what has animal keeping brought us to? Well, it's led to an overall a smaller size, uh, including a smaller size of brain, which of course I would deny completely as far as I'm concerned, they are very bright. 
although that said, oh, I've got two beautiful main two main kittens running around in here somewhere. They may they may bomb the, the webinar. Um, and one, the oldest, he's not very clever. I know I feel so bad saying that, but he's not bright. Whereas the younger one is very bright. And you do find that you find some cats are brighter than others. But it makes sense that cats don't, domestic cats don't need to be as bright as wild cats because they don't have to worry about um, hunting the whole time. They don't need to remember where all the best places are to catch certain birds or catch whichever rodents are their preference or what time of year they would hunt these birds. Another time of year they would hunt these voles or something similar. A vole is a small rodent. So we have got a reduction in brain size and we've got a reduction in cortical folding and a reduction in the visual uh, cortex, which makes sense because, of course, cats are very visual and it's all to do with the hunting. And if they don't need to see so much, then it, the brain, the body doesn't keep making what it doesn't need. Um, also a reduction in the adrenal glands which is fascinating, but it makes sense because it, adrenal glands, you need that to make adrenaline, noradrenaline, so epinephrine, norepinephrine, um, and cortisol. They are your fight and flight hormones. And so cats as wild cats, yes, they are predators, but they're small, solitary predators. They are also prey, particularly for large primates like us, large dogs, large birds. Um, so cats have got to be aware the whole time uh, of what might be here that I could hunt. You know, cat needs on average, depending on its body size, to eat between 10 and 15 mice a day. Or you can switch in birds for that. And if they can get a, a young rabbit, then that's obviously much, much better. But obviously for each of those hunting sessions, there will be at least two or three that don't work. So each cat is going to have to do at least maybe 30 hunting trips a day. And when they're younger, far more because they're much less experienced. So you can see that the amount of brain power a cat would be using the whole time to think of all the best places to hunt, at the same time worrying about where it might get hunted. So where are the places in its territory that are more likely to be predators where are their wolves? Where are their coyotes? Where are their um, humans? Where are the eagles? Whatever the species of the, the things are that could eat the cats. So it makes sense that we've taken that risk away from cats. They don't have to be watching the whole time and worrying the whole time. So their visual cortex has calmed down and their adrenal glands have calmed down. And we've got a loss of the agouti. So here we've got a classic uh, agouti tabby, a kind of more ticked pattern. And we've got far more colours, so from white to colours of tabby to everything uh, and everything else you could think of. So that takes us to animal breeding. This is the last 200 years. Um, and as, as you saw at the start of this talk, they're now the most popular uh, pet in the US and the UK. And quite a lot of northern European countries, like France, the, the cat is just about to take over the dog as well. And obviously a lot of that is because it's with today's modern society, um, city living, etc., that the cat is easier to look after than the dog. But since we have started animal breeding, then there's been rapid and substantial changes from, from wild type. I've already mentioned this is very much global. And almost everything. It, our natural selection. Certainly up until this point, all of those colours were natural selections. But then humans came along and we started uh, cloning. So this was the first cloned cat ever. His name was, was oh, it's copycat, CC. So he was uh, cloned in, in the US and a number of cloning companies are, are available around the world. Um, and then we've got the crossbreds where we have bred domestic cats with a different species of cat. So 
So we've got a snow marble Bengal here. And the Bengals are a cross between the Egyptian Mao type domestic cat crossed with the Asian leopard cat. Um, you've got the, the savanna, the shosi, a lot of different types of cats now that are all crossed with a wild cat. People like that wild look. Although I do have to question, there are so many different breeds of beautiful cat. Why do we need to force different species of cat to breed together when they wouldn't do that in the wild? Personally, I, and I have had a Bengal cat you know, many years ago and before I was sensible enough to think about it and think, no, actually, as an animal advocate, I should be against um, breeding one species with another. So, no. Yes, of course, we keep the Bengals and the savannas, etc., that we already have, and they can breed true as, um, as a pedigree, as a breed. But we don't need to enhance the breed by bringing in ever more wild blood. And I feel that very strongly. A lot of us do. Um, and obviously, these mutations do result in permanent changes to the cat's DNA. I just thought I'd show you how the Bengal breed was made. They were made in. Um, in America. It was part of a breeding program. Wrongly, people had presumed that because few um, Asian leopard cats that had been blood tested, they were FELB negative. People wrongly thought that must mean the Asian leopard cat is immune to FELB. I know, it's a crazy assumption. And of course, they were then trapped and the cats were made to breed together. Um, and when you first do it, what you do is you breed, um, uh, sorry, a, the Asian leopard cat was a female, because obviously a male would be too aggressive. Um, and the Egyptian Mao is, that's the, um, is the, the, the male cat. F1 is the first um, pedigree, first line you get. So the kittens from this uh, mating, the boys are almost always sterile. The girls have got low fertility, but you can breed them, and they were bred back to their father. And that gave you the F2, so the second generation. Boys were still usually sterile. Uh, the girls had increasing fertility, so they could be bred back to their grandfather. I know, pretty revolting. And the F3s, then the males and the females, are now fertile and can breed with each other. And, uh, Yep, let's keep the Asian leopard cat out of the picture now. Um, some of the natural, um, natural mutations that occur, we have the Rexing gene, which gives you the curly coat. That has occurred all over the world in different places. It's occurred, quite, occurred twice in Britain. You've got the Devon Rex and you've got the Cornish Rex. They're actually very closely together in near, um, in one part of uh, the foot of uh, south east, sorry, southwest of England. Um, but oddly enough, they are different mutations. We've got the Manxing gene, originally from the Isle of Man. So this is born without a tail. It's also occurred in Japan, other areas of Asia, although there it tends to be, they have a little tail rather than no tail. And then polydact, so extra toes, um, we see this, the Cats on the Isle of Man often have this. Um, the Hemingway cats in Florida Keys have this, and quite a lot of Maine Coon cats have it as well. And that led to animal breeding. So the first cat show in the world was in London, Crystal Palace, 1871. And the the people who were doing the breeding, they called themselves the Governing Council of the Cat Fancy. I know, daft name, but that's GCCF. And that was established in 1910. Nowadays, there are registration bodies for cat breeding all over the world. But they keep a, a log of all the different cats, who's been breeding with who, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and this has led to changes in coat, color, length, type, face and ear shape, um, eye color, shape, body size, shape, etc. This is some data that we've very recently published, Jenny Irving McGrath, 
my PhD student uh, looking at feline genetics. It's actually fascinating. So what this is doing is showing the genetically related breeds. So you can see the, um, the, the Asian breeds, so Tonkinese, which Tonkinese is a cross between a Burmese and a Siamese, and it then breeds through as a Tonkinese. And the other Orientals, they're all in here. Uh, Burmans, oddly enough, up here, that cat, the blue cat, that was mislabeled. He, he's, uh, he was sold as a, a, a Burman when in fact um, he's a, a, he's a moggy. Um, ragdolls here. Then we, you can see the um, Abyssinian and uh, Sphinx, the uh, Somali, which isn't shown, but it's here as well. Devon Rex, the Bengal is here. So despite the fact it's got a wild animal in it, there's not much of a wild animal left in there. Then you get the Siberian um, and the Russian blue, both coming from Russia, not surprisingly, it's a Norwegian forest cat. Um, far end here, we've got Persians and then the exotic short hair, which of course is just a short haired Persian. So they're here. And the British short hair, which has also got quite a big face with flat nose. But if you look at so our what we call a moggy, a moggy, it's short for mongrel. Um, it means kind of uh, a mongrel, usually used for dogs. It means you, you don't know what they're made out of, what breed are they? They're, they're, they're the standard cat that runs around. So these make 90% of the cats in Britain. They can come as the domestic short hair, the domestic semi-long, and the domestic long hair, as you can see here. You can also see that the Maine Coon and the Norwegian Forest really are not very different from them. But what was wonderful when uh, Jenny looked at the data in another, another way, which I meant to put in, I knew I'd forgotten something, I meant to put another picture in to show you. And what it shows is that our moggies, our cross, we could call them crossbred cats, they're actually purer than a pedigree. Purer than a pedigree. So all of our, all the cats that just get on with it and breed for themselves, you know, they, their genetics is actually cleaner than most of the individual breeds of cats. So we should actually think of our cat of the nation, our national cat, should actually be thought of as a breed of itself. And I think we'll find this is the same in every country, that the, the cat that is the, the non-pedigree cat in most countries, I think, will turn out to be the same. That's a fascinating idea. But it means we should take pride in them. Never call them just a moggy or just a crossbred. No, they are proud. They are a breed of their own. So this then takes me to looking at what can go wrong. I thought I'd share this picture with you. So um, I move this up. Will it let me do it, or is that going to cause a problem? Hopefully that's still okay. Um, oh, I can't fix it. So this is my Scottish wildcat in the top panel. This beautiful, beautiful, beautiful cat. Okay, I'm biased. This was my beautiful Maine Coon. I lost him in November a year ago. He was the most amazing cat. I have had many, many cats in my life, but he is the cat that wrapped his tail most tightly around my heart. A very special cat. And if you look at him and you look at that Scottish wildcat, you can see that's not a path that's traveled that far, really. They're really still quite similar. Not always the case, of course. So I want to talk about when things do go wrong, so we can talk about breed related diseases, and then whether they are associated with the phenotype of the cat, so what the cat looks like, or whether it's just to do with its genetics. And then I've just one slide at the end to mention behavioral. So we've got ever, ever more different types of numbers uh, of, of, of different types of cats, all sorts of breeds and, and, and colors. Here's just a bit of an extent. Here we've got a Siamese, she's called Portia, and a British shorthair. 
uh, silver tally, and he was called Oscar. And you can see that um, they're very different shape. Look at the different shape in their heads, different shape in their ears. Uh, and of course, if, if Portia got up to walk, you'd see she's long and slinky, whereas Oscar is short and, and stocky. Um, so we've got marked difference of extremes. But what we're, what we're finding more and more and more is that there is a real desire for novelty and extreme looks. People want pets that are different, special, uh, I would say crippled, mutants, because what we're actually doing by having this ever, ever greater desire to take on cats that could not look after themselves if they didn't have people to look after them. I think we are really polluting the most beautiful species that is possible. And we're, we're breeding it in such a way that it is abominable. I know that's gone on with dog breeding for an awfully long time and to hideous extents, but I find it really sad that we are doing the same with cats. Um, and yeah, I'm gonna go through some of these breeds. I'm specific, specifically gonna pick on one or two. It doesn't mean that there aren't problems with other breeds. Um, but what's certainly true is that no breed ever remains static. It's always gonna be changing. Uh, the first time I wrote about my concerns about breed extremes was uh, 2008 in a journal in Britain. And I was particularly worried about the Sphinx, so the bald cat um, and all the problems it can have, the Persian and the Scottish fold. So I'm gonna, um, I apologize profusely if any of you are um, absolute advocates of any of the breeds that I point out their problems. But I hope you will listen and just hear a little bit of what I'm saying, that just because it's something that we want doesn't mean that it's what the cat would want. Thinking about size, we've got massive extremes. Naturally, these are two, um, two moggies in Britain. Uh, this is Tabitha. She was about four kilos. And this is Arthur, who was nine kilos, very large for a domestic cat. Um, but you can see we do have that extreme. Um, the, in the pedigree, we've got the Singapura, smallest of which, well, they're normally only about two kilos. Um, whereas the Maine Coon, of course, we can see those up to 10 kilos um, quite frequently. Somebody has left their mic on. Could I ask? That you turn it off because I'm getting reverb. Thank you. But with that extra size does come problems. Um, yeah, I, I kind of look at these pictures and it makes me smile. Uh, what you can also see is how uh, my ever-changing hair. Um, so this is one of my first beloved Maine Coons. This is Jack. Um, I rescued him when um, he was four years old, he could no longer work as a pedigree cat because his hips were so sore. He could no longer mate anymore, but I rehomed him and he became one of our blood donors. Um, this is my, uh, my beautiful Mortlach cat that I, I lost um, uh, November a year ago. This was his hips when he was a year old. This is when I met him um, and you can see anyone who doesn't read radiographs, this is the spine going down the middle, the box is the pelvis, and then this is the hip socket, okay? You've got the, the pelvis and the, the, the femur, the main bone of the leg going into it, and it should form a cup. And at a year old, his hips were horrible, he couldn't walk, which is why he came into my hospital, and I fell in love with him, and his owners gifted him to me. Um, but this is his hips when I checked his hips again when he was four. And you can see just how bad they are. He was always crippled with arthritis. 
Um, he lived his life on painkillers and in a, a small flat, so he didn't have to, to move around too much, um, but not nice. And it, one study found that hip dysplasia in as, is in as many as 50% of Maine Coons. Hence, um, whenever you're thinking about getting a Maine Coon kitten, it is important to ask about their hip status because we don't want cats that have got hip dysplasia breeding together because that just brings that, keeps it going. And then the genotypic disease that they've got um, majorly is hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And it's interesting that it's hearts and hips the same way as the large breeds do, although it's a different type of heart disease. Um, breeding for shape, then it's that the lack of a tail would be the major one that I would bring up and say it's occurred a lot. We've got the American Bob, we've got the Japanese Bob, we've got the Pixie Bob, which is a tiny little cat. I'm just trying to get my pointer back. Okay. But unfortunately, de depending on the, the nature of the, um, man of, of the tail loss, depends whether or not they have this horrible Manx gene. So if you were looking at the truly tailless cats, then these have this horrible mutation. And it means that say no tail, really no tail, and say it's an autosomal dominant lethal gene. You do get a short tailed version, which is called a uh, stumpy, um, whereas this version has got a little stump. This version is called the rumpy. And these poor cats are destined to a life having constipation, megacolon, urinary tract defects, urinary tract infections, uh, incontinence, and some of them have got spina bifida. So, um, you know, the Manx, it's not a, uh, it's not a breed of cat that should really be kept going. You know, that it's a breed that really should be allowed to, to, to just peter out because these cats are destined to a, a life of problems. Also breeding for shape are the munchkins and the kangaroos. Um, or as, as we say over here, don't even start me with these. These guys are destined to a life of, of, of pain, arthritis, and cats are naturally very three-dimensionally aware. You know, if a cat comes into a room, it might hide initially, might go up high. They see the, the whole space. You know, dogs stay on the flat, but cats, they want to jump, they want to climb. And these poor cats haven't got a chance, okay? So these are cats that are, so the kangaroo cat, they're, longer legs at the front but short ones uh, sorry short ones at the front and longer ones at the back whereas the, the munchkins um they're all four short again this is a lethal dominant gene so if they were left to their own devices again they wouldn't exist um and you can see i know some of you are thinking that they're cute please i need you to rethink your, your thought process that Hey, they might look cute, but they're also deformed, they're crippled, and they're going to have a life of pain. Okay, and suddenly they don't look quite so cute, do they? And you can see that the uh, there's lots of versions and um, people breeding sphinxes with uh, munchkins. And if you really want to get it wrong, then you breed something that can't breathe with something that's got really short legs. Yeah. The, um, looking at ear shape, you've got the American curl and the ears curl backwards. That doesn't seem to have any problems. That's fine. But you've also got the Scottish fold, which I know is very popular in quite a lot of countries. Uh, it's very popular in China, in Japan. Um, yes, they can look cute, but the defect that affects the cartilage of their ears affects the cartilage throughout their body. You can see they have these short, stubby tails. Not such a problem, other than they get pain in their tail. And if you look at a normal um, uh, back paw, a normal cat, this is a Scottish fold cat. You can see that the legs, that the toes are all twisted and gnarled and the joints are all deformed. 
And again, if we're looking at the front four, you see the same here. And so these cats have arthritis in their feet very early on, terrible, terrible arthritis. And the, the breed uh, description is often caught, written out as uh, uh, don't need much room, don't exercise much, something like that. Of course, they can't exercise much. They're crippled. You know, you, you, most of you don't know, I, I, I'm disabled now. I, my, my back went um, eight years ago. I have to walk with a stick. And believe me, I would give anything to go back to when I could run and dance and stand on my head if I wanted to. Not that I've ever done that, but now I would want to just because I would want to, but I can't do that. And, you know, we're breeding cats to be deformed. And these are all, you get this horrible bony um, peristosis. So you can see massive bony deformity in these poor cat's um, feet. Just awful, 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 awful. You wouldn't wish that on your enemy. So what about color then? Well, the only one that really carries a problem with it is being white. And being white per se, well, this is a little cat who lives in Dubai. This is the foreign white at the bottom. He's a cat in Dubai. So he can't go outside because he's going to get sunburn. Um, um, and certainly even in Britain, and we do not have a lot of sun, we do see uh, that cancer, um, squamous cell carcinoma on white cat's ears, um, in front of cat, white cat's ears, around their eyes, etc. So even in Scotland, uh, you can have the, the risk of um, skin tumours and things from being a white cat. And then, regardless of which breed, if you have a pale one or more pale blue eyes, you risk deafness. And obviously, a deaf cat will not hear a car coming, and me, which means that they need to become house cats. By way of coat type, we've got lots of extremes. Here we've got a British shorthair with a dense, uh, slightly stiffer coat, uh, the Bengal with the plush, you know, it's almost shiny, red tints um, uh, through it, like gold. Um, and then you've got Zelko Rex, which is a rexed cat, so curly coat and long. Um, so lots of, lots of different variations. Um, by way of the long hairs, we've got the Maine Coon, which is the fur called a, a semi-long hair, but you should see my two, they're pretty long. You've got the rag doll and you've got the Persian, and the Persian's obviously defined as a long haired cat. Um, I might as well mention it here. There was a really interesting study, I meant to put the reference in, I to remember that, that showed that if you look at the length of the spines on a cat's tongue, and they did it, they got pictures of tongues of domestic cats and, and all the way up to lions, and it was tongues was in the paper, it's quite striking. And they looked at the length of the barbs um, on the, the tongue, which is obviously essential for grooming, um, to do with the length of the cat's coat. And up to about a Maine Coon, a cat is able to groom its coat. But a Persian coat is ungroomable because it is so much longer than they can groom. And a cat must be able to groom in one long lick in order for the, the coat to be kept in good quality, which is why people end up shaving them. So if we're thinking about different diseases, the main things I've already mentioned, the rag doll is, again, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Persian's got quite a few problems, polycystic kidney disease, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, bladder stones, idiopathic cystitis. And then their definition, the brachycephalus. The polycystic kidney disease, another autosomal dominant gene. And these, you know, these diseases would die out naturally if they were given half a chance. But if they're given a helping hand, which is what happened with polycystic kidney disease um, in Britain, um, 30 years ago, about 40% of Persians uh, were polycystic. They had their kidneys look like this. Um, now it's less than 5%. So 
it's taken longer than it should. In theory, we could have done it a lot quicker, but at least we have managed it. And there's a Persian demonstrating that its coat is a complete mess. Um, I mentioned the, the rexes. We've got a Cornish rex down here. Uh, we've got Devon rexes. Devon's some of the ones with the pixie faces. The, the problems they have, well, they get these horrible yeast infections. You do have to bath them three times a week. Um, there's Devon rex spasticity, which is a, um, a neuromuscular problem, which actually we don't see too often. Patella luxation, we do see quite a lot of vitamin K deficiency, I see occasionally. Um, so, yeah. And then we take it to the Sphinx. Well, obviously, hot and cold intolerance. They can't go outside because they're going to cook and sunburn. Um, they can't um, dehydrate horribly. And um, their, their bodies, interestingly, they run at a degree hotter. If you take a temperature of a Sphinx or a um, very short coated Rex, their temperature is a degree hotter. It needs to be because they have to keep warm. And so if you hospitalize these cats, you need to make sure that they have plenty of food. They need to be kept away from fans, etc. We've got a big fan in the middle of our intensive care unit. So if we have one of these in, um, we have to make sure that they're covered the whole time. Otherwise, they will get cold. This is a um, poor, poor animal showing how bad these yeast infections can get. It's just covering most of the cat. And then, yes, of course, people are then crossbreeding these and making little short-legged things that, that are not are not a cat. Yeah, that's one of my patients. She was called Marilyn, absolutely fabulous cat. Look at her tail, like a prehensile thing, not like a normal cat tail at all. Breeding for face shape, then you've got the very triangular shape of Siamese, a Balinese is a long-haired Siamese, um, and then you've got the Burmese, which is the more pixie face, all the way out, obviously, to the um, uh, Persian. And if we're thinking about uh, related diseases in the Siamese, um, then thymoma would be the big one. Um, this is a cat's spine. This is its heart, just squished up here. Um, whereas this huge thing here is uh, cancer, uh, lymphoma in the front of their chest. And we see that in young, particularly male Siamese and Oriental cats. Uh, kinked tails uh, are no cosmetic problem, no problem medically, but they're cosmetically not liked. But they're, they're beautiful cats. Burmese, um, very fond of Burmese cats, but they do have some problems. So they're very prone to the di to diabetes mellitus. One in 50 get diabetes mellitus. Um, in some lines, one in 10. Uh, another breed that's predisposed to diabetes actually is the Norwegian forest. They can get low potassium, which is what's happening in this cat here. Her, this is um, mischief and her blood level has got so low she can't pick her head up properly. They can get this lipid aqueous where their eye fills with cream. Uh, they get elbow arthritis, they get um, endothesiopathy, um, and you'll see that in every Burmese cat from the age of about eight years on. Orofacial pain syndrome, this is this horrible disease where because of dental pain, they try to pull out their tongues. Uh, partly, we know more about Burmese because the Burmese breed in Britain has always been very good at working with us to try and work out the genetics of the different disorders. It's not that the Burmese is particularly prone. Which brings us to um, the Persians. Persians and, and, and exotics. So an exotic is just a short haired Persian. To be honest, this little guy looks more like an exotic, although he was sold as a Persian. Some of these cats are beautiful. You look at this face, yes, he's got the big eyes and a slightly more prominent stop. He's got you know, the slightly flat um, uh, brachycephalic face, but he's a perfect cat. But sadly, people, people can be horrible. We don't stop at something beautiful. Yes, it's a little bit different to your you know, a wild cat, it's 
got a bit different from the wildcat, people have to take things further to the point that we've got cats that are so, there's so much of a fold here, their nasal leather is higher than their eyes. Your nose should not be higher than your eyes. Um, this little guy can't even open his face, uh, open his eyes, and he's got this, again, this deep skin fold, which is gonna get infected. And so because of the breeding, Persian is the cat that we've got more information on than anything else, and in the last few years has been overbred more than any other breed. Okay, Persians and exotics. And I've got to talk you through their problems. Respiratory, okay, you squash the face up, you've still got all the same amount of soft tissue in your head, but it's now all squashed up and you can't breathe. Your um, turbinates are completely crushed. Ocular disease. We're going to look at that. Dental disease, awful dental disease. Um, neurological disease, because their brains are all crushed up. Reproductive problems, they've got big heads and narrow pelvises. It's hard for them to give birth, it's like pugs. Ear disease. And actually what I haven't even put in there is skin disease. Danielle, what planet are you on? And obviously skin disease because they cannot groom themselves. And in one big study um, I did um, quite recently, then it was skin disease and dental disease followed by eyes were the three most problematic. These were the diseases that caused Persian cats more problems in Britain than anything else, okay? Skin, um, teeth, eyes all because we bred them that way. Okay, so none of these cats had to suffer for these diseases, all because we bred them that way. This is a brilliant paper that came out in 2017. So what they've done is shown you a normal cat CT, but they've taken off the fur, and I think that can really help focus. And you can see they're showing you where the lower canthus is of the eye. This is a doll-faced Persians. So Persians can come in two extremes. You can have the doll-faced, which is also sometimes called classic, or open-faced, or you can take it to the extreme of the peak-faced, um, overtyped Persian. So we look at a doll-faced Persian, still obviously different to uh, the domestic cat, domestic short hair, but you can see that the medial canthus is still well away from the nose. You look at the peak face, and yeah, we're all, all at the same place. And, and you can just, this does not look like a cat, does it? It looks like Yoda from, um, or E.T. That's showing my age. And you look at the skulls. So this is the same paper. Again, this is Moggies down here, doll faced in the middle, and then the peak faced Persian the way that the skull is completely deformed, the, the eyes completely deformed, the teeth, oh, they have terrible problems with their teeth, as you can see, and with teeth all over the place. So, which means, of course, that makes grooming even harder, and it really predisposes them to dental disease. This was a study I did, oh, I started this when I was an undergraduate, so there you go. Um, I went to university in, 19, in 1985. Oh my God, it was published um, 10 years later. It took a while. Why did it take so long? Um, actually, no, I, fin I finished it in 1991. It only took me four years to publish, but it took a while. What I did is I looked at about um, 3,000 litters. Um, overall level of dystopia, difficult birth, was 6%. Um, particularly, I um, had a, a large non-pedigree colony, they only had 0.4% reproductive problems. But you can argue, it's not like they were living, doing things for themselves because they were a, a breeding unit. And to be honest, because they were a breeding unit, they were being used for food trial. So um, you can argue they didn't breed from cats that had problems breathing, breeding. So they, they got that lower. Um, and in this study, for some reason, I didn't have that many Devon Rexes, but they were certainly having uh, big problems. But other than the Devon Rex, the highest levels of dystopia were in 
the Siamese type faces, pointy faces, and that is because they got primary inertia. They had so many kittens, their uterus went, I don't know what to do. Um, or as I like to say, they were simply too posh to push. Um, and it was the Persians. And with the Persians, sometimes you got one big kitten that got stuck, or it would be one, the, the kittens, they got malpresentation. So because they had no nose, the nose comes up onto the inside of the cervix. So if a kitten's nose comes onto the cervix, nose should open it up and allow being born. But if you've got no nose, then your head drops down or it goes to the side and you can see why they can't get born. And so I saw most dystopia in, in the extremes. Um, we then redid this working with um, International Cat Care, it was um, Feline Advisory Bureau. We did, redid it 10 years later. And we particularly were looking at different breeds to see why they were having problems. And the Persian leaps out at you. It's just terrifying. 25% mortality. So stillborn, dying in the first week or dying in weeks one to eight. So one in four Persians were dying by the time they'd got to eight weeks old. That's horrible stats. And why was it? Stillburn, stillburn. And it's interesting, exotics weren't very popular then, um, but we had a lot of stillbirth there as well. So that is where you've got kittens that can't get born because of all these malpresentation problems and overly large kittens, this narrow pelvis and a big head. And those that didn't die from stillbirth had such traumatic dystochic birth, they got suboxygenated. And because they got lack of oxygen, they got brain damage or they got brain damage from the birth itself. And so they were and a dummy, um, didn't suckle properly, and they died within the first week. Um, so we are now redoing this um, with a couple of my students at the moment, and it will be interesting to see how things have changed over this time period. Um, I mentioned the, the, the stillbirth and neurological problems, and it's actually quite terrifying when you look at, actually, I'll sidetrack it for a little. If I go back to that, there was um, a paper on neurological problems in Persians, and what it showed is that quite a few breeders know when they've really got it wrong and they call the kittens, they do call them dummies because they can't be weaned, they, they, they can't be weaned properly and then they can't be litter box trained and Persians are the worst cats for litter box training. Um, yeah, so training them anything was very difficult because their mentality was so damaged. And if you look at uh, these MRI pictures, so the top picture is of a, a Persian cat. Um, you can see that this is the, the, the cerebellum. Actually, let's go to the bottom one. This is a normal cat. You've got the lovely uh, cerebellum there, uh, sliced through like a, I always think it looks like a cauliflower. And then rest of the brain here. And then we're going into the, uh, uh, going down to the nose here. And you can see the sort of shape we should have. Whereas here we've got the Persian, and the cerebellum is squished so much, it's actually getting pushed down into the spinal cord. So we've already got uh, coning. And because of that, it means the CSF can't drain properly, which means you get an internal hydrocephalus, which is what's happening here, and you get a buildup of CSF. And of course that puts the even more internal pressure. So you've got the, the uh, external pressure from the skull trying to squish all of the brain size that is a normal cat. And then you've got this internal hydrocephalus adding to the problem. It is no wonder that so many Persians are not happy animals. Um, these come from the, the same um, paper. Uh, and what they're showing, this is the, 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 the Schmidt paper, um, so this is the, the normal cat, this is the, the Persian. 
Um, and that's the dull face version. So yes, it's much, very foreshortened, but the cerebellum isn't actually coning, etc. Um, and there's no hydrocephalus. You look at the peak-faced Persian, quite often extreme hydrocephalus. Look at this one. Quite so much hydrocephalus, there's almost no brain left. This cat, oopsie, would be completely dumb. Completely dumb. Um, and so formal moggy, don't even see the CSF. Just a little bit of white lining and look how bad it can get. So yeah. Awful things we're doing, these poor cats. And then this was a paper I did with um, Ronin Chen, uh, one of my uh, Chinese uh, students from the master's program. And what she did was she sent out, it was, it was disguised. We were just asking for, what does your cat look like? How does you look after your cat type thing? And we asked people to send pictures of their cats based on and side on. And we ask questions, um, you know, does your cat have any problems breathing, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And it, it's not a stunning paper. It does what you expect it to. The shorter your nose, the shorter your nose, the more breathing problems you're gonna have. I know, it's hardly gonna set the world alight, but it's important that science proves these because a lot of breeders go, no, yes, there's problems with dogs, but cats don't have problems. Actually, if a cat hasn't got a nose, he's going to have problems. Um, and this is a lovely paper. It's looking at the um, nasolacrimal, or nasolacrimal drainage. So here is a, a mild Persian, grade one, beautiful cat, just gorgeous. You can see she is so pretty. You know, her eyes, she's got big, wide open eyes, that beautiful, pretty doll face that you get with mild brachycephalia. I can understand, I think they're beautiful, absolutely beautiful. But why do we have to take it to the nth degree? Because here is a severe grade four, and you can see that we've got entropion, the eyes are uh, eyelash, eyelashes, eyelashes are all rolling in, so this eyes are going to be sore, the tear duct, doesn't simply cannot um, drain. We've got the nose leather this high up. You look at the difference in the skull. So with yes, brachycephalic, but still working. Here, not a hope. This cat can't chew properly. Its teeth are horrible. And you can see the. Um, this is another problem that we have, which is uh, open mouth jaw locking, and this happens with uh, Persians or exotics when they yawn. Or if you were doing a dental, you open their mouth too wide, then because of the altered anatomy, they can stay locked open. And then let's look at eyes. Um, I always think they're the windows to the soul. You know, you want a cat with beautiful eyes to look back at you. Um, but that is not what you see in so many Persian cats or um, exotics. So here we've got discharge, chronic discharge, facial staining, which is a risk of um, becoming a fungal infection. These little hairs, um, there's those little hairs there, it's just a close up. The center of the eye, because the lids don't close properly, means that it doesn't get um, tear film on it, and so it dries out. Um, and it dies. And that is a, a, a cor um, corneal sequestrum, which again, it's a problem with these, these breeds. This one is just horrible. We've got a bacterial infection over the top, same here. Um, again, we've got cysts, all sorts of horrible stuff coming in here. And then you get these horrible um, eyelid cysts, all to do with your eyes not working properly because you've been squidged. So if we look at this beautiful, unusual, this is a, a chocolate um, a Persian, absolutely stunning cat. Look at that, absolutely beautiful. And this is a little a chinchilla, a little bit too much, starting to get discharged. This cat, interestingly, it's unilateral, um, but you know, 
the nose leather's getting small, maybe that's just not draining enough. This poor cat is gonna have yeasts, funguses, etc., in his folds, and then this cat, and you can see where she's been rubbing her eyes, rubbing her face, because she's so sore. And if we look at exotics, you know, again, this is a little exotic who hasn't been taken to the extreme, but so often they are very extreme, where the nose is, you know, right up with the nose leather. Now her face is clean, but she's only a kitten. This little kitten is, um, this one is, she is at 12 weeks old. She gets very tired when she's trying to play because she can't breathe properly. And, you know, these cats all have to have their eyes wiped, cleaned multiple times a day to stop the tears all gathering up and drying and becoming crusty and infected. And she hates her eyes being wiped. She's only a baby and the whole rest of her life, this is gonna be happening. And why don't we just, I, I'm absolutely not saying no Persians, no exotics, absolutely not. I'm saying, let's go with dolphins. Let's just back off on the extreme. We still see the beautiful cat, but it doesn't have all the problems. And I know every breeder will go, oh, but my cats don't have any problems. And that's not true. Um, these just happen to be two of my patients that were both in about the same time. This is little Bunny, he's a, uh, an exotic. Um, and this was uh, Sandy. They both came in because their noses prevent the, prevented them breathing. They were getting um, a regular heart rate. They're getting uh, sinus arrhythmia, marked sinus arrhythmia. And in fact, they have both gone into cardiac failure because their hearts were working so hard and both of them are five months old. So I saw both of them a couple of weeks apart and it just, just broke my heart. Broke my heart. Those babies didn't need to go through that. So we owe them better. We are their guardians. We are their advocates. We owe them better. And then my last slide, um, sorry for going on, um, but I did start late, but hopefully you've still got a little time to ask me some questions. I'm not going to say much about behavior, but we certainly know that um, uh, certain breeds um, will like to have certain behaviors. And the typical, um, so the pika, so eating weird things, and that would be the um, orientals typically. But a paper just came out challenging that, so I need to have a good look at that. Um, actually, one of my one of my students, sorry, presented me with the paper. I need to have a look at it. Um, but it used to be that the Burmese was the top of the list for the aggressive dominant or the aggressive cat, not dominant, cats don't do dominance, but aggressive to people, to other cats, you know, the local despot. Um, and of course, as soon as Bengals started becoming popular, then they knocked Burmese off the top of the, the tree. To, now it's the, the Bengals, uh, particularly bored male Bengals can be very, very aggressive. And the savannas all climb up that tree to become aggressive once we have enough of them in the country. So my last thought is, if, Leo, if this is a good enough thought for Leonardo da Vinci, it's a good enough thought for me. So I hope that gave you some things to think about. I know you won't all agree with all of it, but I'm here to speak for the cats and I will happily answer any of your questions. Thank you so much, Prof, for your talk. It was really, really insightful, and I'm sure everybody learned a lot about feline domestication. Um, I'm quite mindful of the time, so we'll have to limit the number of questions, even though we've actually received quite a few. Um, so once again, thank you for, for sending in your questions, and I'm afraid that we will only have to limit to two questions tonight because of the time. Um, so we'll move on. We'll go to the first question. Um, did cat coloration evolve due to specific environmental requirements apart from temperature? So will we see lesser colored cats now with global warming? I think that's a brilliant question. And I'm gonna be quick, so it might sneak in a third question maybe. I honestly don't have any data on that, but certainly um, you tended to get black cats where it gets cold and that makes sense. You know, a black cat in a very hot country that cat is going to overheat. So I think we're able to, black cats were able to live when they mutate, when that was a, a mutation occurred in cold countries. Where black kittens were born, they tended to cook. And so they didn't go on to breed other colors. 
I hadn't seen anything. Right. Okay, so the next question, I think there's some uh, interest in behavior. Uh, so there are some questions uh, apart from the physical ailments, which probably have covered quite extensively. Are there any behavioral um, differences between the, can you share a bit more about uh, behavioral differences between the, the different breeds, um, considering the vast differences in skull morphology? Yeah, some of the some of the biggest ones. It's certainly the um, Sphinx and the um, Devon Rex. Uh, certainly, the, the 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 Sphinxes have been bred to be very very human. That uh, they need people. They're not very good at cope doing anything for themselves, um, which makes sense because they simply wouldn't stay alive if it wasn't for humans. So uh, people like them because they need them you know it's you know you've got this cat that needs you to do everything for it but I don't think that's I don't think it's fair to breed cats that are that needy you know you, you should have a cat that you can open the door and it walks out and it copes perfectly well without us so certainly the oriental breeds um the rexes tend to be um uh, uh coat better well I go with oriental breeds so your Siamese Burmese um, Balinese, etc. All of those are really good at living with their siblings. Um, so if you're going to have a multi-cat household, it's much more likely to work if they're oriental cats. They're much more likely to get on with each other as a starting point. Whereas if you've got Persians, they don't seem to get on very well. If you've got um, Russian blues, they don't tend to get on very well. And so the cats that are further away from our most bred cats, our most bred cats, cope with other cats better because we bred them to be that way. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Um, thank you so much, Prof. Uh, maybe if I think I'm just looking at the time now. So I think we will end the, the webinar today. And if there are any burning, burning questions, uh, we can invite you to stay back in the call to answer some of them. Uh, so we've come to the end of the first day uh, of our webinar on feline mythology. We hope that you found an, the webinar very useful and enjoyed yourself. So head over to our Facebook page, Animal Bus SG, for more educational information on animal ethology and like regular content. Uh, we also hope that you will join us for our next talk tomorrow by Dr. Jenna Kitty uh, at 8 p.m. same time, and she'll be speaking about social behavior of the domestic cat. So if you did not manage to catch uh, today's session in full, you can also catch it on our NPARCS SG YouTube page. Thank you, everybody, and good night. Good night, Thank everybody. You, if you would just stay back for a little while, that would be great. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Thank you.